Hey everyone, my name is Garel, and today we're going to be taking a look at a new From the Depths topic. Uh, this has been one that's been requested by quite a few people over the course of the tutorial series. This time we're going to be taking a look at ACBs, or Automated Control Blocks. These little things are... they're kind of insanely complex, and they're something that's nearly unique to From the Depths. A lot of other vehicle building games that I've seen try and have something like this, but very few of them get anywhere near to the power and complexity that these things can give you. So uh, we're going to be going through kind of how these work, what they do, and some ways that you can use these in uh, ways that are not immediately intuitive. Not everything that you can do with an ACB is listed out in this interface right here. And there's some very important things that you need to know about them that the game doesn't really explain very well. So we're going to go through this, and I'm going to uh, try and take you through as many of those things as I can. If there are things that I miss, please feel free to let me know in the comments down below, and we're going to take a look at as many things as we can with regards to this system. Uh, there's just a lot going on here. There's a lot you can do with it. There's a lot of really interesting projects you can do with this, uh, and it's really an insanely complex system. So odds are I'm not going to be able to tell you everything about what works here, what doesn't, but what I'm going to try and do is give you a general idea of how everything fits together, how we're going to be able to use that to come up with useful tools for our vehicles, and uh, some of the limitations of those systems. So uh, here we go. This is going to get interesting. All right, so the first thing you're going to need to know about ACBs is the fundamental concept behind them. These are, at their heart, an if-then statement. If you don't know what that is, you're, uh, say you don't have a programming background, uh, the fundamental concept is that if some trigger occurs, then we do some sort of action. That's really all there is to these. That's the fundamental backing behind everything that you're going to see from here on out. So, if this, then that. There's actually a, a cloud service by that name that lets you do all sorts of fun automation uh, tasks for, say, a smart home. Uh, it's kind of an interesting tool, and if you guys want to go out and play around with it, I would highly recommend that. It's actually quite interesting, and there's a lot of interesting things you can do with it. Uh, fundamentally, that behaves very similarly to how these ACBs work. We have a condition, and we have an action. If the condition occurs, then we trigger the action. Uh, we can set timing on that, we can set a few other factors about how the condition interacts with the action, um, how frequently we can trigger that action, uh, what the range and filters are around that action so that we don't, you know, hit everything on the vehicle with that action. Uh, but we'll get into all of that shortly. First thing I want to take you through here is these condition groups. Now, all of the conditions and actions here, these are all modified fairly frequently when the game patches. So uh, instead of taking you through every single one of these and all of the ins and outs of them, uh, partially because that would just take forever, and partially because these get changed fairly frequently, uh, I'm just going to tell you what these specific groups of actions are for and conditions. And we're just going to go through the var various different groups, what sorts of things are in here, and what you can expect to find there. From there, you should be able to just click buttons and figure out what's going on. You're not going to break anything with experimenting with these, but there's just a lot of stuff to go through here. So I would recommend some experimentation and just taking some time to poke buttons and figure out what's what. That being said, let's go ahead and get into our control groups here. First off, we have the miscellaneous group. Miscellaneous is a bit of an interesting one. Miscellaneous basically is everything about your environment or metadata about the world. So we're talking about things like, is the vehicle loaded into play? Uh, has this, this particular ACB that we're setting the condition on taken damage? Uh, have we executed a timer? Or, uh, basically, you can set a timer for, say, three seconds, and then every three seconds, uh, this ACB will trigger its target action. Is there an object directly behind the ACB, uh, or in front of it as the game, in, as the game terms it? Um, are we between a certain time of day? So, for instance, if you wanted to turn on lights, you can do that uh, at night and have those just come on at night. Uh, are we within a resource zone? We can trigger certain actions like refining fuel only when we're inside of a resource zone. So, uh, you can make a ship that will, you know, drive up to a resource zone, stop there, harvest resources, and only produce fuel during that time. 
The next category of conditions is vehicle statistics, and this is both information about the vehicle itself as well as the resources contained on the vehicle, and there's even a few things here relating to steam engines. I've not really done a tutorial on steam engines, that will be coming up soon, but uh, for now, uh, steam pressure is used to generate power, and you can do a, various, a few different various things with detecting uh, what the steam pressure is that's currently built, uh, what the RPM of the closest gearbox is, i.e. how much power we can produce using that steam. Uh, and, you, you know, you've got some various different things relating to steam there. You can trigger stuff when the vehicle's been attacked by a laser, uh, when you have subconstructs that have gotten to a specific health, and then there's a bunch of different resource-based uh, triggers here. So uh, you can trigger things uh, in a lot of different ways based on the information about your vehicle. The next grouping down here is the vehicle attitude grouping, and this is basically just information about your vehicle's direction, uh, how fast you're going, what your pitch and roll and altitude are, whether that's over sea or terrain, uh, speed, basically all that stuff. The next grouping up is control, and this is basically, you can uh, command an ACB to trigger when a certain type of control input is received, or the vehicle tries to maneuver in certain ways. So you could, for instance, uh, turn on or off jets facing certain directions. Uh, generally, I tend to not like doing this, especially when you come down to using PIDs. Uh, PIDs are going to have a hard time playing with ACB-controlled thrusters, so uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here that might not be what you want. Uh, so in general, I try and avoid this control grouping unless there's something very specific that I want to have happen. Say if I want to control uh, swept back wings when I get a propulsion command to go forward. Uh, I could uh, control wings on spin blocks to turn backwards and make it look like a um, Tomcat jet transforming its wings to, uh, into its high speed mode versus its uh, mode for landing stability. Um, so yeah, you can do various different things with uh, this visually. I would generally try and avoid modifying vehicle mechanics based on these control inputs though. You've also got an enemy grouping here, and these are based on all enemies. So if they're, uh, for instance, this range group here, I can trigger if there is an enemy between 0 and 3,000 meters. This is any enemy anywhere in that range. If any enemy exists in that range, then I will trigger this ACB, uh, or trigger the action assigned right here. I've also got an inversion here, so I can say if an enemy is not in that range. That's a pretty common thing with a lot of these conditions. You can invert the condition to say, if this condition is not true, then I trigger. So as you can see here, we've got range, altitude, bearing, uh, which is the uh, yaw off of straight forward that the uh, enemy exists at. Uh, we've got speed, we've got health, we've got power, volume, and uh, this has one thing that we're not going to see in the next grouping, and that is missiles or torpedoes. So we can tell if there are missiles or torpedoes within a certain distance of us. Uh, and that's very useful for triggering off, say, uh, interceptor missiles. Uh, interceptor missiles are not fired by an anti-missile cannon controller unless they're on a turret. So uh, this helps you basically set up a missile system to fire uh, when there are missiles within a certain distance. And you can kind of force those to fire and get something useful out of that, even if you don't have your anti-missile system on a turret. Say if you're vertically firing your uh, anti-missile systems. So uh, we've also got target information here. This is the exact same set of information without this missiles torpedoes, but all of this relates to the specific vehicle that is being targeted by this vehicle's AI. So if you remember, we have a uh, target uh, prioritization card on a lot of our AI systems. Uh, this will feed us back information about the enemy that is being specifically targeted by that card. Uh, if we don't have one of those cards, this will generally lock onto an enemy and stick there until it's dead. So uh, your target will, in that case, not change much. But either way, whatever the target of the AI is, that is the information that you'll be getting out of these uh, conditions here. So next up, let's start taking a look at our action groups. And the first of these is the buoyancy group. Uh, this basically affects everything that gives buoyancy, i.e. positive lift just by its existence. Uh, and this set of grouping is more or less just intended for boats 
You can do airships with helium pumps, but generally speaking, I'm not a huge fan of those. Uh, either way, this is everything relating to uh, those general buoyancy things. The next grouping here is AI. Uh, these are all about setting up various different modes on your mainframe or various other AI components. Uh, you can turn on and off ACBs or manually trigger them via another ACB. So this ACB can trigger the action of another ACB, for instance, um, using this execute action down here. Uh, you've got various other different detection components. You can turn those on or off. You can change uh, settings about various different aimpoint cards, wireless transmitters and receivers, PIDs. You can turn on enemy simulators. So you can uh, activate or deactivate a vehicle simulating an enemy. Um, you can do all sorts of fun things with these uh, AI components. Uh, AI is very powerful now, so uh, being able to turn that on and off and modify settings about it is very useful in some circumstances, especially when you're building up, say, target vehicles for testing purposes. The next grouping is moving parts or drones, and this is all about uh, modifying subconstructs and uh, uh, things that are spawned from your current vehicle. So you've got uh, things that you can edit about spin blocks and pistons and turrets. Those basically uh, change the angle of things that are on your vehicle. Like I can turn turrets, I can turn spin blocks, I can extend or retract pistons. Uh, I can also open or close doors here, interestingly. Uh, that's a little bit of an odd one. I've not figured out why that's uh, particularly important as of yet, but I suppose you could do some cosmetic things with that. You've also got constructible spawners and docking stations. These are more or less just tools to uh, help you manage sub-vehicles. So you can spawn new sub-vehicles and have them built up via uh, repair tentacles on your ship. And when those are ready, you can have those automatically released with an ACB, uh, or you can have them held onto and released via another ACB. Uh, you can have docking stations, uh, release assigned vehicles, recall them, uh, the ACB, interestingly, can also go on the sub-vehicle and can give commands to a docking station that you are assigned to. So you can have a sub-vehicle that can command its mothership to undock it or dock it. You can also set distance here. Uh, there's all sorts of fun things you can do with that. Next grouping is controls. These are all about uh, modifying the controls that you have available to you. So you can tell sails to do, uh, you know, winch in or out. Uh, basically, you can set the uh, extension of the sails. You can turn propulsion components on or off. You can turn fortress controls on or off. Or you can give them a specific control input, so you can tell them to move in specific directions on fortresses. You can set a specific speed that you want to maintain. Uh, you can trigger warp drives. You can uh, trigger complex controls with this activate here. You can. Uh, see that this will activate complex control key, and as I slide this down here, you can see that it goes through all of the complex controller keys, all uh, uh, 14 values of those. So you can do a lot of very interesting things with that. Next grouping here is weapons and defenses. You can change basically every setting of every weapon and defense here. All of your shield projectors, all of your ring shields, your uh, countermeasures, i.e. your lambs, your decoys, your... Uh, um, shaft emitters, uh, basically everything about your uh, decoying and countermeasure systems can be modified here. You can change simple weapons or uh, set their uh, elevation or azimuth. Uh, you can fire weapon systems. There's all sorts of things that you can do with this grouping. The next grouping it doesn't look like much, but it's actually fairly important. You can turn on or off ammo processors and refineries. Uh, and basically that lets you control how much, or um, it lets you control how the resources on your vehicle operate. So uh, say you have a very efficient fuel refinery uh, on one vehicle and an inefficient one on the other vehicle that's just enough to keep it in combat and running. Uh, so th that one is your main combat vehicle, but you have an out of combat vehicle with a much more efficient refinery that you'd prefer to run in order to produce most of your fuel. So your in-combat vehicle might run out of fuel during a vehicle, or uh, during a combat, rather, and it might need to, you know, keep shooting and keep moving in order to win that combat, so you could have it turn on its own refinery when its fuel gets below a certain percentage. 
but you don't want to waste resources by running that refinery all the time. So as soon as the combat ends, you can turn that refinery back off and bring your other vehicle with a more efficient refinery into play. Uh, so ammo processors, I've not found a good reason to turn these off in the current version of the game. They will not produce any ammo unless there's uh, space in your ammo storage in which to place that ammo. So turning these on and off is a little less useful in the current build of the game, but it's still there if you want it. Uh, power is also quite useful. You can turn on or off electric engines, fuel engines, or steam engines, and you can set the percentage of output that you want. Uh, basically, fuel engines, you can set their maximum RPM. Steam engines, you can set their uh, target pressure or burn rate or whether they use automatic pressure regulation. Uh, you can also open valves or set a maximum pressure on the valve, rather. Um, and that will, you know, uh, vent steam above a certain pressure. And that's really all there is to that one. This is also very useful if you've got, say, a very inefficient fuel engine that produces a ton of power that you want to turn on just in combat. And you've got another fuel engine that is enough to run your thrust that you just keep running all the time. So you could uh, turn on your inefficient fuel engine while you're in combat or your steam boilers uh, while you're in combat and then turn them off when you get out of combat. The last category here is miscellaneous. This is mostly cosmetic stuff with two exceptions, and I'm not entirely sure why these aren't moved up into the weapons and defenses category, but for some reason smoke dispensers and missile laser emitters are down here. Uh, my personal opinion is that those should be up in the weapons and defenses section, but they're down here for now. Uh, interesting to note, smoke generators are purely cosmetic. They are not a smoke defense. That is a cosmetic block only, whereas smoke dispensers are the actual defensive smoke measure. Uh, don't mix those two up or bad things will happen. All right, so now let's start taking a look at some basic concepts. Some of these are going to be pretty familiar to anyone who studied computer science. If you haven't, don't worry about it. I'm going to explain these in detail. So the first thing is that uh, two disconnected ACBs that are uh, not adjacent to each other will act as an OR. Uh, and what that means is if you have two different ACBs with different conditions set to affect the same target components in the same way, that acts like saying, if this or that, then do this other thing. So if I have, say, um, let's say I have an enemy within uh, one, 0 to 1,000 meters, or I have an enemy within uh, 2,000 to 3,000 meters, then I will have uh, let's say a docking station turn on. Uh, so we'll recall assigned vehicles in this case, and we'll recall all assigned vehicles in this case. And docking stations, and recall all assigned. So basically, if there's an enemy within 0 to 1,000, or there's an enemy within 2,000 to 3,000, then we will recall all assigned vehicles. What the use case is for that specific setting, I have no idea. That's just an example. The next concept is the concept of uh, slave ACBs. These basically act as AND gates, and this can act either as an AND gate for a condition or an action, depending on how you set these ACBs up. So what we've got here, if I have, uh, say, two things, and I want those both to be true before I trigger an action. So let's say that we are w both within a resource zone, which this construct is in a resource zone, uh, and the there's a target within, or our targeted enemy rather, is within 1,000 meters. Uh, then let's go ahead and uh, let's just say set the up command. Let's see here. Up, yes. So uh, in this case, if there's an enemy within 1,000 meters and we're in a resource zone, we'll start going up if there's an enemy nearby. Right now, this condition is true, this condition is not, so we're never going to do this action. Uh, if we wanted to reverse which one of these had the action on it and put the action on this one instead of this one, we could do that and the results would be exactly the same. Now it's worth noting here that if I was to add another action to this same ACB, then I no longer have a slave ACB here. Uh, so this one, if I set a valid target action on ring shields to set drive, uh, then this one is executing, 
This one will execute if there's an enemy within 0 to 1,000 meters, but those two are not going to cross. They do not have any interaction with each other anymore, even though they are still adjacent. So the slave ACB is only a thing if either the target or condition is not specified. So uh, you want to be careful with that. Uh, let's see if we are, let's just go ahead and say within resource zone, and let's set this one to timer. So every one second, we will give an up command. And you can see this is kind of flickering here. And we'll get an execution of this uh, every one second. Uh, that's not going to last for more than one frame, uh, just due to the way that this ACB is set up, because this particular condition is only, yeah, it's only actually going to uh, happen once per second for a microsecond. Um, it's used to start an action usually, but it's not going to stay active every other second or anything along those lines. Also worth noting here, just as a point of reference, we can have one condition trigger two actions by attaching a condition to one of these ACBs, and we'll just say pistons uh, extend to 100%, and we'll say uh, over here, um, shield projectors turn on, uh, or turn to laser scatter mode. So both this and this will execute because this one condition over here is true. Uh, so this is effectively doing two actions with one condition. Uh, you could technically also set the condition on this ACB and have the same result, but generally speaking, it's a little more resource efficient to just have it uh, propagate from or have the condition propagate from one ACB to all adjacent. Uh, it saves a few processor cycles that way. So uh, generally speaking, having ACBs adjacent to each other is important if you want to start doing more complex uh, animations, for instance. Uh, if you want to mix um, rotation or spin blocks and uh, pistons, for instance, in order to complete uh, create some sort of complex animation, so say you're trying to build a mech walker and uh, you need to have some sort of interaction between the various different joints on that and they all need to operate at roughly the same time. Having these ACBs adjacent to each other where they can execute each other is probably pretty important because you want the triggers to all go off at the same time and for the same reasons. And you don't necessarily want to be copying and pasting those settings all over the place. That's just a pain. So uh, you can kind of tack all of these together and have one set of conditions execute multiple actions. You can also have multiple conditions executing multiple actions by adding another ACB onto this and giving it another condition. So I can say if the vehicle is uh, between 90 and 100% health, then we'll execute. And we now have this executing because both of these conditions are true. If we were to invert this and say that the thing is not within 90 to 100% health, uh, our actions will no longer execute because this slave condition over here is not true. So we can mix and match these as we need. The next little subconstruct I've got over here is a very interesting one. This is a memory cell. Uh, one of the main things that you run into fairly frequently with ACBs is that you can't really remember things. So if I have a condition that's uh, gone true at some point and it's no longer true, then I no longer execute that ACB. Uh, so to demonstrate, if I have an enemy uh, within, say, 0 to 1,000 meters, and I want something to execute when I have... Uh, well, this is a bad example here. So let's say I want to open the doors of a missile bay when an enemy is below 1,500 meters or closer than 1,500 meters, but I don't want to close those doors until they get much farther away than that. So if there's an enemy within, uh, or say closer than 2,000 meters, I want those missile bay doors to remain open because they take time to open. And my 1,500 range missiles I don't necessarily want those not being able to fire because an enemy is 1,501 meters away. So I might tell the bay doors to close at 2,000 meters. Now, uh, 
normally that sort of uh, thing wouldn't be a problem for that specific scenario, but there are a lot of cases where you need to remember the state of the doors, say if you have other conditions and other actions that are based on those doors and their state. Uh, so you might need to have something like a memory cell like this. Now, a memory cell is a very specific arrangement of a spin block and ACBs. And what this does is you have a condition over here for object presence. And this checks if there's something within a certain distance. Now, normally this won't trigger if, say, uh, there is a block on your primary vehicle. So we can say if there's an object within 0 to 1 meters of this ACB right here. There is nothing in this one block right here. And let's say I put a chair here. Uh, you can see that this has an object here. Uh, so it looks like I was actually incorrect. These will trigger if an, uh, the object is actually a block in front of the ACB. So uh, you don't necessarily want to have blocks in front of an ACB that's checking for object presence. I was incorrect about that. So uh, you need to be a little bit careful about how this is set up, but uh, overall what we've got here, we've got an object is not within one meters of this one, but an object is within one meter of this one. So right now this ACB over here is returning a true response. So let's say that we had a timer over here that uh, went off every one second. Uh, and we'll just set up, uh, let's actually use this one over here. We'll do a timer. So every one second, um, we will rotate this spin block over here. And we're going to rotate that to, uh, in fact, let's go ahead and use this guy. We will do spin blocks, rotate to 180 degrees, which is exactly opposite. So you can see that went off once every second and it rotated around like that. Uh, we can bump up the motor drive there to spin, uh, speed that up a little bit. And we're just gonna set the rate at 30 rads per second just to make sure that that moves nice and quick. So now every one second, this will rotate to 180 degrees. If I was to uh, temporarily turn that back off and over here, uh, let's just say uh, on this ACB that I want to rotate to uh, 0 degrees, and we're just going to use this test button to forcibly trigger that. You can see that went around much quicker. So um, right now we've got this spin block over here, which will, on this guy, trigger once every second. So we can say, let's uh, turn our timer back on, and let's do once every, let's say, 10 seconds here, uh, just as an example. And we're going to rotate to 180 degrees. And we're going to limit our range here a little bit so that we're just controlling that one spin block. Okay, so that's good. Uh, we have this all set. And we're going to remove the action on this one because it's acting as a slave ACB for now. So now, once every 10 seconds, this should spin around and point at the other ACB. So let's say that we have... Okay. So uh, this is now pointing over to this ACB, and this ACB is now active. So then we can say over here, uh, let's say if there is an enemy that has spawned, um, uh, this is a bad example. Let's say I've taken a control input. So uh, let's say we've gotten a um, complex control input. Is that a thing here that we can read? does not appear to be, so uh, we're going to have to actually go back to none on this, and we're going to have to move this one block away in order to separate from the other, and we're just going to set an advanced stimulus trigger here for the T key, and then I'm going to plop down an advanced controller, uh, complex controller, and I'm going to put down a chair here, work myself to the chair, so now uh, what I've got here is when I hit the T key, this will rotate back around. And well, it should, oh, it helps if I actually set up the target action. Uh, let's go to spin blocks and rotate to zero degrees within 10 block meter or 10 meter radius. 
And so now if I hit T, it rotates back around this spin block. So effectively what I've done here is I've checked for if the T key has been uh, pressed within say the last 10 seconds. That's very difficult to do without this sort of memory cell. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at something we can do with that that might be a little more useful. Basically this ACB is there if we have not pressed the T key. So uh, let's say, uh, let's go to our fortress controls and we will set the fortress turbine to forward. Uh, so if we press the T key, we will go forward for up to 10 seconds based on the last time that timer triggered. And then over here, uh, we will do nothing. So if I press T, you can see the fortress starts going forward until that other timer triggers and then it turns back off because this memory cell has turned back off. So you can set up timed memory cells, you can set up memory cells to do things based on conditions that are uh, very difficult to normally set and hold an output on, and you can do all sorts of fun things with that. Uh, it's a useful construct, but do be aware this does take up a fair bit of space, and it's not very durable. Uh, that's in fact consistent across all ACBs. Uh, durability is a huge issue with these. You want to be very careful about where you put them in and how you armor them. Uh, you definitely want uh, a lot of surge protectors, heavy armor, anything that can soak up EMP damage, because it will seek these things out and kill them like crazy. So we've looked a lot at what ACBs can do. Uh, let's take a look at how they can do it, or uh, more specifically limitations on them. Uh, you want to be able to limit what all your ACBs interact with very often. Uh, if, for instance, I wanted to limit the spin block over here so that I'm not, you know, uh, turning this spin block over here. I want to limit what ACBs are actively uh, interacting with that spin block over there, and I want instead to just modify this one. So I used range for that because it's nice and easy and quick to set up, but there's a lot of other tools at your disposal here. First off, control flows into sub-objects, not out of sub-objects. So if I was to have an ACB on, built on this spin block up here, uh, this ACB can affect things that are on this spin block, and it can affect things that are on spin blocks also on this spin block. What it cannot do is affect anything on the base vehicle itself. So uh, control will flow into spin blocks and further down the spin block chain, it will not flow backwards to the outside vehicle. It's very important and very useful to know. Next, as you saw here, we can also limit in the target and action tab, we can limit the effect range. So we can limit the range at which will affect a target. Uh, all targets within this range will be affected. And generally you just play with the slider until you see the appropriate number of blocks being controlled here. Um, it will tell you how many blocks will actually be controlled by this. Uh, the ACBs will only ever affect blocks that are allowed for the specific action type that you set up, so you don't have to worry about that. For instance, the spin blocks control is never going to affect a piston, but you still have to be a little bit careful in order to control just the ones that you want. Another useful technique is that using the shift N key combo, you can name any block on your ship. And I do mean any block. If I want to name this random metal block in here, I can do so. Uh, yeah, I can name that armor. So now as I'm looking around, I can see these metal blocks over here are not named armor. This one is named armor. So uh, yeah, uh, it's moderately useful when it comes to naming armor blocks. It, those are usually disposable and you don't really want to get attached to them. So I would avoid giving them names, but uh, you can also name things like AI components. For instance, I can name this AI component uh, to be uh, weapons AI, and that might be useful for turning on or off a weapons AI controller or turning a uh, specific control over to it at specific times. So uh, you can name components, and then down here uh, in your target action, you can set up a search pattern for those names. And what the search pattern lets you do is I could say I want to control everything with the name weapon in it. Uh, so then I could say, in this case, that is affecting the spin block and it's uh, everything within eight meters. So 
that's not really particularly useful unless I come back over here and name this something like uh, weapon memory cell. So now this is getting triggered by this ACB over here because uh, this target action is looking for things with weapon in the name and this spin block has weapon in the name. So uh, that is useful to further restrict what can be there. Uh, you can do all sorts of interesting things by including a list of keywords in the name and then having different ACBs interacting with different uh, keywords out of that name. So you can do, for instance, uh, weapons defense, and um, you can have things that operate on the defense category, and you can have things that operate on the weapons category. Then you can have some weapons that are only named weapons and some that are only named defense. So you can turn all the defense things on at once, for instance, and then you can turn all the weapons things on at once. And both of those subsets will include the things that are named weapons defense. So you can do various different interesting things using tagging in that uh, manner. You can also prioritize which ACB gets control of something. So for instance, uh, over here, I could set a priority of zero on this timer, and I could set over here a priority of, uh, let's say, one. Now, this ACB that I just set to priority one is going to take priority over this other ACB. So now you can see if I press T, this comes over here, and we our memory cell is operating on this ACB, and I can hold this uh, T key, and you'll see that this ACB uh, this memory cell rather will not twitch. I can hold this for 10-15 seconds here. It's always over here. And then I can release the T key, which I just did, and we should see within 10 seconds that will flip back around. So uh, this ACB is prioritizing its command over this other ACB even when this one activates. The next trick you can use, uh, and this is a general building trick that applies to nearly every component in From the Depths, if you've got something with settings that you want to copy, you can use Control C and Control V. So say I want to copy the settings from this ACB to this ACB, and so I can Control C and I can Control V, and now this ACB is using the exact same settings as this one. It's probably not what I want, but uh, for this ACB specifically, but it's useful when you're setting up a lot of components and you don't want to have to hop into and out of the queue menus in every single one of those components. You just want to set them all up the same way and you want to do so quickly. So at Control C and Control V, very useful in that scenario. Another thing you can do here uh, that I didn't really go over in depth, but you can modify things based on these advanced stimulus triggers. This basically allows you to hook up to uh, various different control inputs from these advanced or complex controllers. As you saw in the action group setting, you can also hook those up to various different actions from uh, the, uh, let's see, where is it, the controls, yeah, you can modify the complex controls here, and so you can, uh, you know, affect your uh, complex controller inputs here, I can, uh, you know, give a trigger for the T key, I can also read those control inputs on other ACBs, so you can see how that can chain into itself even further. All right, so we've talked a lot about the theory over there. Let's go ahead and take a look at this practical example we've built up over here. This is, well, practical example might be a bit of a stretch for what's going on here. This is a cannon system that uh, swaps between the flak and smoke shells depending on whether there are missiles or lasers hitting the vehicle. This is a terribly impractical example, and really it would never fly in any serious vehicle because by the time this thing finishes activating, you would already be pretty much dead from any serious weapons system. But it's kind of a fun example. So let's go ahead and start diving in here. First we've got uh, two APS customizers, this one with a basic flak uh, shell and this one with a basic smoke shell. And uh, we've got over here some ACBs. Uh, we've got a memory cell in here uh, with these two ACBs uh, triggering based on where this uh, metal block is. And we've got more ACBs over here. So what we have here is basically when one of these ACBs uh, sets triggers, then this uh, cannon will get all of the shells cleared out of its clips, and the ammo intakes will be reassigned to uh, one of these APS ammo customizers. And when the other set triggers, again, it will clear the shells out of all the clips and will uh, set the ammo intakes to the other 
instance here. Uh, simultaneously, underneath here, we've got different AI components, and we'll need to turn on the anti-missile cannon controller if we're using flak shells because we need to shoot down missiles. But over here, we'll need to turn on a local weapon controller so that we sh uh, shoot smoke shells at a target vehicle if we're getting hit by lasers. Um, basically, we don't. the anti-missile cannon controller won't have anything useful to fire at uh, if we're getting hit by lasers, whereas the local weapon controller will. However, the local weapon controller will not shoot down missiles, so if we are using flak shells, we need the anti-missile cannon controller. Uh, a lot of uh, very interesting things going on there at once, but the upshot of it is that we're going to try and fire the right type of ammunition for the right type of enemy offense. So uh, th that's a fairly complex set of things that need to have or that need to happen there, but really we're just kind of tinkering with the settings that are already there. Uh, this cannon is perfectly suitable for both of these types of ammunition. They're very similar. They both operate on timed fuses. Uh, you can see here that we've got an ammo controller ID of 67 for the flak and 68 for the smoke. So um, let's just go ahead and walk through our ACBs real quick. Uh, over here, uh, if the vehicle has been attacked by a laser in the last 10 seconds, then we want to swap to smoke uh, because we're getting attacked by lasers. But we also don't want to swap to smoke if we're still getting hit by missiles. This thing has some overhead time. It takes time to clear the clips and then reload with smoke. So uh, we don't want to, if there are missiles in the air, we don't want to do that. We want to stay firing our smoke shells, or rather we want to stay firing our flak shells until there are no longer missiles to shoot. So uh, we check if there are no missiles within 3,000 meters. And uh, also if the vehicle has been attacked by a laser within 10 seconds. But we also want to check if our memory cell is moved to this position. And that's a little interesting, but uh, basically this acts as a state toggle. Uh, there is no way once we've uh, set the ammo type in here to determine what ammo type we're firing. So uh, in order to know what ammo type we're already firing, we have to have a memory cell in here. Uh, of some sort. There's a couple different ways we could do that, but this does it without needing to tie up any control inputs or any other information. So uh, this is the method I've cho chosen to take this particular action. So uh, once that is, those conditions are met, we need to do several different things here. Uh, on this particular ACB, we have a target action of uh, setting the ammo intakes to the smoke shells. That's this uh, ammo controller 68. We also want to clear all shells. And I've gone in and named all of the uh, ammo intakes. So uh, these ammo intakes are all named defense uh, or defense intake. And so that uh, will limit this ACB's effect to the intakes on this particular cannon. Uh, so we also want to set the receivers uh, again, I've named those with Defense Flak and Defense Smoke um, uh, for the two different receivers down here. The uh, Defense Flak receiver is connected to the anti-missile cannon controller, and we want that to be turned on when we're firing at uh, missiles, but not if we're firing smoke shells. And we want this uh, wireless receiver to be turned on when we're firing uh, smoke shells, but not when we're firing flak shells. So this one is named Defense Smoke because this is the one that's going to be used to fire smoke shells. And this one's Defense Flak because it's going to be the one used to fire flak shells. So again, over here, I've got this set to turn the uh, receiver for the uh, flak off and return the receiver for the smoke on. So uh, that sets it to the transmitter channel that is set up over on this AI over here, channel one. Simultaneously, I also want to rotate this spin block to negative 90 degrees uh, so that this memory cell will turn counterclockwise and move over here, which will then trigger this ACB over here. Uh, so that tells us that we are now firing smoke and it is possible to switch back to flak. Basically, if I didn't have this memory cell in here, what would happen is, um, these ACBs would all be valid at the same time uh, whenever we're being hit by lasers regularly, but not being hit by uh, uh, missiles. 
And what that means is we would effectively switch ammo types or attempt to run that ammo switch routine uh, every 10 seconds or so. And it's, or more frequently than that, potentially even, which would uh, constantly be clearing those clips. And if you constantly clear those clips, then you don't have ammo to actually fire the smoke shells, the, they don't stay in the racks, and bad things happen. So we need this in order to make sure that the ACB chunks do not trigger too often. Uh, the memory cell helps us prevent that. So um, in this case, over here, we do exactly the opposite thing. Uh, again, if there are missiles or torpedoes within 3,000 meters and we've not been hit by smoke within the last 30 seconds, uh, then we go ahead and, you know, do exactly the opposite. We clear all the shells again, uh, we rotate this spin block back over here, uh, we set the receivers down here to fire with the anti-missile cannon controller instead of the uh, local weapon controller, and we set up um, the ammo intakes to run off of the flak shells. So, all that being said, that's what that does. Let's actually see if we can see it in action. So what I'm going to do here is I have this vehicle set to God mode so it can't be damaged. I'm going to load in my little uh, radar missile drone on the Deep Water Guard team. And this is going to fire some missiles. And you can see that uh, flak cannon, this is set in flak mode. It's firing flak shells. It's just going to fire flak and it's going to take out these missiles pretty reliably. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and destroy all enemy vehicles. All right, so uh, we're going to give that uh, just a few seconds here because we want to make sure that the uh, uh, timers over here are all reset. And then let's go ahead and uh, let's load in actually a Lightning Hoods. Uh, I believe it is the Volta. All right, and I apologize for uh, cutting away there. It turns out I needed some additional laser detectors on this thing in order to actually detect when a laser is being fired at me. But now you can see this uh, terribly impractical cannon here is firing smoke shells, and it's firing at the enemy vehicle instead of at missiles. So that's kind of what I was shooting for here. Uh, we've got a cannon that will fire uh, at flak, or fire flak shells at missiles, unless it cannot, uh, or unless it gets hit by a laser and not missiles, in which case it will switch to smoke shells. And if I want to, I can destroy enemy vehicles here, and I can load in another, uh, let's go ahead and load in the missile radar drone again, and we'll just load that on the deep water guard again. And we should see this here, it will fire a missile. We're not going to shoot at that missile quite yet, but given a moment uh, for everything to reset, we should see the uh, wireless receiver for this local weapon controller turned off. The one for the anti-missile can controller turn back on, and we should be in the process of loading flak shells here. So now we see missiles coming in, and we shoot flak shells at them, and that takes out the missiles. So terribly impractical example. You would not want to use this on any sort of a live vehicle, but it's kind of a neat and interesting example that demonstrates kind of all of the features of the ACBs working in harmony. So that's all I've got for you today. Hope that was interesting and uh, informative, and that you learned some. Hope you'll be able to apply this to your own vehicles. It's always fun working with ACBs. This logic system is something that you don't see uh, in a lot of other games, so it's really something fairly unique to Farm the Depths, and it's really fun to play with. You can do all sorts of crazy fun animatronic stuff with this. Uh, it's just a joy to play with. So I hope you have fun with it, and I hope I'll see you back on the next tutorial. We're going to be straight taking a look at breadboards. All sorts of fun to be had there. See you next time.